you may be seated. Let's join together in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for so much that you have freely given to us. Help us as we receive that to have grateful hearts that also desire to be generous and willing to share that so that the holy things of God can continue in this world and into eternity. In your name we pray. Amen. Every Thursday, my wife has a habit, and it's not a particularly glamorous habit. I wouldn't even say that it's a habit that she enjoys, but it's a habit that she does for the sake of our family. Every Thursday, she sits down, and in some way, she goes through our family finances. So she might look at our receipts, she might balance the checkbook, she might look at credit card statements, but in some way, she's managing our finances. And, and some of you have that same habit in your house, maybe with a greater frequency, maybe with a lesser frequency. But, but what that reveals is that we all have spending habits. See, my wife, because she looks at our family finances, she knows what my spending habits are. They're right there in front of her. And all of you have spending habits as well. In fact, if you look at your monthly expenses in terms of a pie chart, and you color code that, all of us have different spending habits. Maybe we're spending money on our mortgage or on our utilities, or we're spending money on, on health care or eating out or groceries or entertainment or, or kids' activities or, or kids' tuition or vacation. All of us have different spending habits. And what I've realized in the last year and a half is that COVID has changed our spending habits. So, uh, there's an article that came out in the Wall Street Journal. And, and this was about a month or two months into the pandemic. And, and, and they attached this helpful graphic that showed that some of our habits had changed. Some, in some ways, because of the pandemic, we were spending more money in certain areas, and in other areas, we were spending less money. So, we were spending less money when it came to our travel. Why? Because nobody was going anywhere. We were spending less money when it came to health and exercise. Why? Because the health clubs were shut down. We were spending less money maybe when it came to going out to eat. Why? Because the restaurants were closed down. So there were some ways in which we were spending less money. But then there were other ways where we were spending more money. So uh, we might be spending more money when it came to online purchases. Why? Because we're not going out as frequently, but we've got Amazon and we've got online orders, so we're doing all of our shopping that way. We were spending more money when it came to our online entertainment. We were spending more money when it came to some of our grocery shopping purchases because we were panic buying. I don't know if some of you remember the toilet paper shortage. Like going to the store, and it's strange, but if there's toilet paper on the shelf, guess what? We're buying in because God forbid that we should ever run out of toilet paper. We were spending more money when it came to our home improvement purchases. I remember looking on social media feeds during those couple of months with the shutdown. It seemed like everybody was either painting their walls or they were updating their bathrooms or they were putting in new flooring or they were adding entertainment centers outside, putting in a new pool or a new patio area. I mean, everybody was going crazy with these purchases. The COVID changed our spending habits. And, and there was a recent article in Forbes magazine earlier this summer that showed that some of our spending habits because of COVID, they're still in flex. Because there are, there are some people, when it's come to their spending habits, they're, they're still a little bit gun shy. They're still not sure if they're going to have enough. They're still not sure if there's not going to be another global shutdown that happens. And so they're socking money aside. 
And that's called the new frugality. Think back to the Great Depression and what happened. People just held on to things. And that's what we've seen some people trend toward. But there are people on the other end of the spectrum who just all of a sudden have this urge to splurge. They're like, you know what, life is short and there's no guarantees of tomorrow. And so as long as I can, I'm going to live it up and I'm going to travel and I'm going to live extravagantly. Now, I don't know where you fall in that spectrum. Maybe some of you, you're a little bit more toward the frugal life. You're a little unsure of what the future holds. And some of you are like, you know what? I'm tired of all of this. I'm just going to live life up. And you've got this urge to splurge. Whichever end of the spectrum you lean toward, the truth is we all have spending habits. And here's what I've realized. Our spending habits reflect what we value. Jesus says this. He says it in Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, look at your monthly expenses. Look at your bank account. Look at your receipts. Look at your credit card purchases. And as you do, I will be able to tell you what is important to you in your life, what you value, because Jesus says it flat out. We spend money on those things that we value, on those things that are most important to us. So on this Commitment Sunday for us as a congregation, I want to spend a little bit of time looking at something that I call holy spending. How can we, in our spending habits, continue to develop the habit of holy spending? And here's what I mean by that. Holy spending is dedicating the first portion of our income to the holy things of God. And this is all over the pages of Scripture. You go back to the original offering. This is Genesis chapter 4, the offering of Abel. And it says that he brings from the fat portions, from the best of his flocks in an offering to God. And God looks with favor on his offering because he brought his best and he gave it to the holy things of God. Then you fast forward a little bit to Genesis chapter 14. Now we have Abraham collecting the spoils from war, and the first thing that he does before he pockets it is he gives a tithe. He gives 10% of it to a particular priestly king in that region by the name of Melchizedek. By the way, Melchizedek shows up in the New Testament book of Hebrews as we're told that Jesus is a priest in the line of Melchizedek. So you think about what Abraham did in giving 10% back from the spoils of war to Melchizedek. This is what you and I are invited to do as well, to give back 10% of the things that God has entrusted to us to the holy things of God. And then you get to the book of Numbers. And throughout the book of Numbers, there's a number of different offerings that God's people are invited to participate in. And in Numbers chapter 18, verse 8, it speaks of a holy offering. And this holy offering was simply giving a portion of their income to the priests who worked at the temple to ensure that all of the holy worship of God's people could carry on so that the sacrificial system could carry on through the gifts that these people made. This is what holy spending looks like. It's dedicating the first portion of our income to the holy things of God. And behind this practice is this principle. Put first things first. Now maybe some of you have heard that principle before. It actually comes from Stephen Covey who writes a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And in that book, this this principle number three, And he uses it in reference to how we spend our time. So when it comes to the decisions that we make with what we're going to do with our time, there is both the urgent, what's right in front of us, and then there is the important. And he says that that people who live a highly effective life are able to weed through the urgent to be able to make decisions about what they do with their time that is focused on what is most important, that aligns with their values. And I believe that this is true not only when it comes to how we spend our time, but also when it comes to how we spend our money. Because when it comes to the purchases that we make, there is what we would say is important. If I were to ask you to sit down and put together a spending plan and identify what is most important to you in your life, you'd be able to make a list of those things. But so often, you and I have spending habits that are both impulsive and compulsive. 
which means that we make split decisions about what we're going to do. You go to the grocery store, and you didn't intend to get it. It's not on your list, but there it is in the aisle. And so what do you do? You make that impulsive purchase. Or some of us have compulsive habits, and we wouldn't say that's the best use of our money, but we find ourselves going there again and again, rather than choosing to put first things first. Now, this principle of first things first, it actually comes from, not from Stephen Covey, it comes from Jesus. Because Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. By the way, Jesus says these words in the context of talking about finances. All over Matthew chapter 6, he's talking about finances. So he throws out phrases like, where your heart is, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Or you can't serve God and money. Or just before this, he says, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. When you think about all of those items that fit into the pie chart of your spending, he says, don't worry about what you're going to spend on your medical bills. Don't worry about what you're going to spend on vacation. Don't worry about what you're going to spend on groceries. But seek first his kingdom, and his righteousness. Spend your money in such a way that you are putting God first in your life. And as a result of that, everything else falls into place as well. I put together a video earlier this week that I think demonstrates this principle well. Let's watch. Aren't you glad for time-lapse videos that allow you in 40 seconds to see what took me five minutes to put together? See, I'm trying to listen to your feedback and shorten my sermons a little bit. (laughs) But it's easy to see that principle at work. There's different ways that we can organize our lives. We can focus on the smaller things first and put them in. And as we do, what gets squeezed out, what doesn't fit, is that most important thing, that biggest rock, our relationship with Jesus. But if we put that relationship with Jesus first, when it comes to our spending habits, everything else falls into place as well. So when it comes to applying this principle, here's where I would challenge you when it comes to your holy spending habits. On the first day of the week, put Jesus first by setting aside the first portion of your income. And this is straight out of Scripture. On the first day of the week, this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. On the first day of the week, make a regular habit of that. Our first day of the week, Sunday, that day that we gather to worship. And then he says, each of you, This is not some of you. This is not Paul saying, hey, those who are wealthy, those who have something left over after you've spent all of your money on the necessities of life. No, this is each of you. And this is what we're inviting you to this weekend as a congregation. Each of you received in your bulletin a commitment card. Each of you as members of the congregation also received this ahead of time. And this is not some of you that we're asking to fill this out. We're asking each of you to take some time to prayerfully consider how you can give to the holy things of God as they happen here at St. John's. So each of you should set aside a sum of money. It doesn't say how much that is, but a sum of money proportioned to your income. And for Paul in this particular context, this is him recognizing there is needs in the church in Jerusalem at that time. And he says, all right, I want you on the first day of the week to start setting aside money so that when I come, I can take that collection to meet the needs of those Christians living in that community. 
So, on the first day of the week, put Jesus first by setting aside the first portion of your income. Proverbs 3, verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your income. Pretty straightforward. The first of the week, the first of what you receive to the things of God. And this holy spending reflects what we value. We value the things of God. We value the things that are holy in our lives. We value gathering to hear the holy scriptures. We value gathering to receive holy communion. We value gathering together in holy conversation, in holy fellowship. We value seeking a holy God who enables us to grow in holiness. And so your giving, your engaging in the habit of holy spending allows that to happen more effectively for you in this congregation and for others in this congregation and community. That's holy spending. And for some of you, this is just ingrained in you. I said at the beginning of the series, each of us is at a different place with these habits. So some of you, you have this habit of holy spending down. Because you saw it in your parents. You saw as they faithfully wrote out that check every Sunday before they came to church. And you've carried this on. Saturday night, you are writing out that check. You're putting it in the offering envelope. You're bringing it here. You're dropping it in our giving box. And I see this even for people who aren't able to regularly be here in worship. There's no excuses for them. Even when I visit someone who's elderly, before I leave, Either they personally take time, often painstakingly with arthritic hands, to write out a check, or they have an offering envelope that is out, and they say, Pastor, can you bring this back to the church? Because they value the holy things of God, and they want to see that continue here in our midst. And that can happen two ways. That can happen by you faithfully bringing your offering envelopes, but that can also happen through automatic giving. Just think of it in terms of bill pay. Some of you, when it comes to your spending habits, maybe it's with your utilities, you just automatically are paying for that. Your kid's tuition, you're just automatically paying for that. That amount is set, and then it's taken out of your bank account. You can do the same thing when it comes to your giving to the church. And this holds you accountable. It's not like, well, let's see how much is left in the checkbook. Let's see how much is left in the bank account. No, this is me saying, First things first, I'm going to put God first, I'm going to look at how he has blessed me, and I'm going to give back my first portion of my income to him. I'm going to put first things first. So as we wrap things up today, here's what I want to say. This is not me being heavy-handed to you. This is not me saying, I'm going to twist your arm so that we can meet our budget here at church, because guess what? We've been able to do that for over 150 years. God has blessed us. There are hearts that have been touched and will continue to be touched. So I'm not telling you what you have to do. Because this habit of holy spending is actually rooted in what God has already done for us. It's rooted in the gospel. Because what has God done for us? God has given first to us, and he's given us his first and best in Jesus. John 3.16 says what? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, his first and best, his only. He sacrificed all of it. He spent all of it before you ever gave a dime or a dollar to him. He gave everything to you. He spent it all on you. Why? In order to redeem you, 1 Peter says with his holy, precious blood, in order that you might be his own, in order that you might have an eternal relationship with him, in order that you might be made holy in his sight. This is what he desires for you. And remember what I said earlier. Our spending habits reflect what we value. So if God spent everything on you, then guess what that means? He values you. You are important to him. That's where the habit of holy spending starts. It starts in the heart of a holy God who wants to draw you into his holiness. So as you consider your financial spending habits this week, may you continue to put first things first. And may you engage in that habit of holy spending. Amen.